Local programming on KRWG made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to another edition of Fronteras. We've been through one of the most interesting races that we've seen in our community in quite some time. And we're always talking about how things are changing in our community, how things are changing in America, and how this happens to be a capital of the Latino Hispano community on a national scale. And if what we just saw happen in the races here begins to take place nationally, well, we're in for a pretty interesting political season. Primaries have just concluded, and it is a rare time, it's a rare occasion that anyone gets to speak to the people behind the scenes. You usually hear of political consultants, uh, political operatives operating behind the scenes, but usually you don't really get to know them. You don't really get to know their opinions, and they're some of the most valued opinions by the people that are running that you do get to see a lot of. And this particular political roundtable we've invited a handful of the political consultants that were involved in not one but several of the races uh, that just concluded here in El Paso for the primaries and to really get in depth just a little bit about what just happened. Is there really a new face of politics in our community and what does this all mean? So joining us this time around, we've had him on our show before, we have Dr. Joseph Villescas of Villescas Research, Media and Instruction. Joseph and I go way back. He was very involved in a couple of the campaigns as a political consultant and uh, had the ear of, of one of the big races here on, uh, in our community. We also have joining us from Quixote and Associates, the two principals of Quixote and Associates. I usually say they're the James Carville, Mary Matlin of our area, just because they're, they're always involved, they always have an opinion, and, and sometimes they're at odds with one another, but they're both playing for Quixote and Associates who have been involved in a couple of the campaigns here as well. We have joining us Diana Ramirez, as well as Hetzemani Yanez. Guys, welcome to the show, and uh, thank you for joining me, because I know sometimes you know, political consultants don't really like to come out from behind the scenes, and, and I thought this would be a good time for us to just, just talk about, well, what happened? You guys were involved in the races, some on the winning side, some on the losing side, some were full of a lot of energy, a lot of uh, difference of opinions, others were a little more kind of going underneath the radar. Let's just open it up by asking, what just happened? What just happened, Hector? Um, when you and I were coming up here in El Paso, there was a political establishment that was derived from 20 or 30 years of struggle post-civil rights. Mm -hmm. We had a uh, traditional leadership base that reflected most other districts in Texas, I would argue, with some token Hispanic representation in the delegation, increasingly more so by that point, by the mid-90s. And there was a dramatic tectonic shift that happened or began to happen in the early 90s and culminated probably by 96 or 98. Mm -hmm. Since then, we had a landscape that has seemed pretty permanent and has positioned El Paso at the forefront of border discussions uh, at, as a key stakeholder in larger national, international, uh, transnational Latino issues. And interestingly enough, El Paso has established itself through our federal representation and the U.S. House of Representatives through the congressman uh, for these many years. Right now we're moving forward into a new era. And from a consultant's perspective, I think what we recognize is that the players do change, but the political and social landscape that we're operating within, we have to continue to work within it to groom the candidates that will try to enter this into some domain in six months or in two years from now. And so for the last nine months, in my case, uh, myself and a number of other uh, political consultants and politicos and, and people in between, camp hardcore campaign supporters, I think there is, believe it or not, a network of advisors and consultants that are at all of these political events, that are at all of these community meetings, and during campaign cycles, even if you are on a, a, a variety of, 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 of your, your, you're aligned with a variety of different groups, inevitably, you start to know who all the other consultants and politicos are. So a lot of the conversation is around the fact that there may be a new face of politics. It was recently in the El Paso Times, big headline, 
uh, new face of politics. And actually, on, the, on that cover was uh, new state representative Mary Gonzalez was on this show not too long ago when she was in her campaign, uh, just kind of boasting a new face of politics. So are, is there really a new face, or is it just a bunch of revolving faces that, that are still? I, th I think we have to be very careful in uh, describing a new face of politics. I think that was the case in a, in a, s a couple of races. But as far as countywide races, I don't think that it was any kind of referendum. Um, I think uh, you, you had a lot of crossovers, 3,000 plus, I think, on the Republican side come to, uh, to the congressional race. You had uh, super PACs that were really, really going at, uh, at, at the top contenders there. And uh, you, you also had a lot of Republican players donating money to a specific candidate. Um, the other issue there was that uh, you, you had a lot of voters that just didn't come out. Um, and that was especially below the I-10 area. Um, I, I think those were major contributing factors to, to what this new face may be or may not be. Um, specifically because if we don't get uh, the people below I-10 to vote, uh, their voice is going to continue to just be diminished. Diana, you, you, you agree with, with, with what's been said around the table? What, what I'm hearing thus far is, well, new faces, same game. Would you agree? Not entirely, because <laughs> that's not any different. <laughs> um, I think, uh, specifically with Mary, um, she is a new face of the Valley. She is a new face of politics, because um, she's the first woman ever to be elected in that scene, the history of District 75. Mm -hmm. You can't say that's not a new face. That's Absolutely. dramatically, a, a, a very dramatically different face. Mm -hmm. um, she is, is representing farmers down in the Valley. She's representing the new growth in the east side of El Paso. She's a new face that represents old and new at the same time. And so I think in, with her win, I think it's very historic for El Paso. I think we should be very proud of ourselves, especially after um, the, the domestic partner benefits issue at the city level and, and um, the coalition of, of pastors who uh, really pushed for the recall. Even after our community, community went through the, those struggles, um, they were able to elect Mary Gonzalez, and so I think that's that's great for our community, and we should be very proud. And that's certainly one one area where we agree. Um, Mary Gonzalez, uh, she came out and uh, uh, ran for this position, and uh, she had a lot of issues from the very beginning. Um, she she wanted to work with the people, not just in El Paso, but those who uh, are sometimes forgotten, and that's the farmers, that's the people in rural areas. One thing, though, although there is a new face in politics. What we are watching, particularly in this race and, and in, her, in her district as well as uh, countywide, is there is a balkanization of voters that has happened. And what you're starting to see is that Mary's victory is tremendous. But if you critically analyze that victory, there was uh, negative sentiments, you know, whispered and overtly stated about her that is a type of politics that has not gone away from El Paso. And although we are progressing in terms of our representation and, and who we are, we, are, we are bringing forward from our community, there are still some deep-rooted forms of discrimination and racism, not only uh, against candidates, but even in the funding and establishment and selection of candidates. Well, let, let's clue in a little bit of voters, and I also want to get right into an issue which we seem to be all kind of talking around. The, obviously, the race that we're talking about is Mary Gonzalez, District 75, State of Texas, uh, you know, State House. That particular race was interesting. It had um, Mary Gonzalez, uh, who was largely relatively unknown in, in the community uh, prior to this race, going against Hector Enriquez, who was known, had served in the Socorro Independent uh, School District's board. Uh, and he, he had been involved. His family had been involved in pol politics in the past. He had money in his campaign. Also against Tony San Roman, Mary ends up winning. Mary ends up winning because of the consultants that she had. Mary ends up winning <laughs> because That's of my her. argument. Well, I mean, we're, me we're talking about consultants here, <laughs> okay, but I'm telling you, but okay. she had, she chose the right team. And she chose if you the look right at team. Her, if you look at her opponent, who had a number of different options to work with, he mismanaged that campaign. Now, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of hay was made over who was on that team. Not only did she have local consultants, but she also had a lot of support from 
the state of Texas, coming from the state apparatus in Austin. A lot of people were, were talking about, at the end of the day, did that have anything to do with, with her victory, the, the state support? Did it fall to the wayside? A lot, they were trying to make a lot of hay, at least one of the uh, opposing candidates. It helped, it, it helped in this manner. It, it helped bring in money. And even though um, Hector Enriquez tried to uh, criticize the fact that most of her money came in from, El pa from, from out of town, the reality is they had almost equal amount of money from El Paso donated to both of their campaigns. It's just that Mary had more money coming in from Austin and from out of, out of town. And so um, it, the way it helps the campaign and it gives you money to do, to handle your day-to-day -day operations, to do the direct mail, to do your canvassing, to do your poll sitting, and that's really where it makes a difference. It doesn't matter where, you know, if the money comes from El Paso or out of El Paso. The fact is it's people coalescing around a candidate that they would like to work with at this at the Capitol and that's and and in in terms of for example her biggest uh, criticism is Annie's list her biggest right. donor that's 23,000 women across the state coming together to support another woman and that's that's great I mean why why would she turn down that money it helps her get her message out one of the interesting things that came up it's obviously already come up in this discussion uh, Joseph, you kind of couched it a little bit along the lines of discrimination. Um, Diana, you, you were kind of talking about it along the lines of, of, of some of the things that uh, the opposing parties were, uh, were mentioning in this particular race. The issue of gay rights in El Paso, the issue of running as an openly gay candidate, is El Paso at peace with that? Because we've been through different races, the Norma Chavez situation. Uh, that used to be a very big piece. Uh, you know, a lot of people say that that may be one of the reasons that uh, Norma Chavez lost because of one of the debates that happened between um, her and the new state representative uh, that unseated her. It, how does El Paso, was this even an issue in this particular race? And I know it's a hard issue to talk about. I, I don't think that uh, El Paso is at peace with it just yet. Um, unfortunately, there's a, uh, it's something that becomes too politicized and instead of trying to get both groups to talk on what they can agree such as bully resolutions or bully uh, legislation uh, they, they just uh, fight on issues that uh, they can't agree on in this case you had a, a very young candidate very intelligent candidate and Mary Gonzalez who who didn't allow that to set her back she talked about the issues she talked about uh, what was necessary for, for this community to come together and uh, as you know her district is very different in, in some of the areas you have one of the poorest districts in, in the entire state and uh, perhaps even the nation who are living uh, with over 49 percent in poverty rate um, who, who she somehow connected with El Paso and that's one of the great things that, uh, that she brought to that's, the table. That's the thing like you know, you look at a candidate, at any one of these new candidates, you had 23-year-olds and, you know, on up that were running, and sexuality and their feelings towards different populations in terms of equal rights, I think what it allows us to do as a community is to reflect upon, are we willing to, to discriminate as a community that's been discriminated against from being on the border of being predominantly Latino? Are we going to tolerate that here as well? Mm -hmm. Are we going to espouse hatred when we work so hard to erase institutional hatred? And although there is backlash because some people or some, some sectors of voters are, are uncomfortable with this change, I think for the most part, we see a community that, you know, for a long time was, was cognizant of, of how race matters and how uh, dis discrimination has functioned along this way. But what we're finding now is that we are a community that embraces everybody. And in a democratic primary, it's a, an inclusive process. And one of the things that I think El Paso does lead the way in is showing that you know we don't tolerate these these an, uh, anachronistic traditions of the past. You know we're not going to allow that to continue. And although we are still making progress and we still have a ways to go, I do feel like this is an indicator that our community is steadily moving forward mm -hmm. and leading the way, particularly along the border. You know, I'm gonna I, I'm gonna have to probably agree with you on that point. And in just this regard, my observation, which was interesting, and I'd like to get your guys' take on it, it seemed that negative political tactics being utilized around that particular theme ended up blowing up in candidates' faces this time around. Whereas in the past, it was kind of, well, if you did it the right way, some political operatives would actually advise you for something like that. Uh, but it seemed like we were, 
in a, in a new, a little bit of a new era because they didn't seem to stick. Or, or am I wrong? I think we had an elongated primary season and the more mud that was thrown by anybody, whether it was uh, intended to initiate hatred because of sexuality or because of connections to a certain group or what have you, that we began to desensitize audiences uh, and started to present our political landscape as nothing but negativity. And the further we got to March, April, and you know the recent election, I think we really did uh, lead to some voter fatigue in terms of these types of messages of hatred. I think people get to a certain point where like, okay, I get it. You don't like this other person for a tax assessor or for w whatever the candidate is, is running for. But what do you bring to the table aside from spewing hatred and telling me what that person did wrong? What is your vision for the future? How are you going to make it work? How are you going to work with everyone in this community you know, that's on the in-group that you're describing as well as those on the periphery to make this happen? And that's where I think our campaigns on, on every level got kind of derailed because we had such a long season to, to work against each other. No one started talking about what we can do to evolve our community further. I, I think uh, we also have to look at uh, the overall slate of candidates across the county. Yeah, let's look um, at the other races too. They, they, uh, they, they didn't allow this issue to you know, keep them quiet uh, by any case. Um, uh, take for instance uh, former police chief Carlos Leon. Uh, he, he was very clear that uh, we're all created equal and uh, he, he doesn't believe that the government should, should, uh, uh, should, should uh, go what, what, what words am be I looking involved. for? Yeah, well, he, he does believe that they should be involved, but uh, you look at it from an economic standpoint. Mm -hmm. um, you, you have uh, partnership benefits, for instance. Um, he, uh, he just thinks that uh, if, if, if somebody gets sick um, and they can't pay the, uh, the, the cost for the hospital, well, then you have, uh, uh, you have them going to county. And then who pays county? Right. Uh, we do, as taxpayers. So he looked at it from a fiscal issue. He looked at it from a... Uh, just uh, a human, uh, from a human side. So I had to say, you bring up uh, the Carlos Leon race. Uh, obviously, there were a lot of other races going on. I mean, there was Carlos Leon versus Lisa Montelongo. Interesting race. Uh, there was also Vince Perez now in a runoff with former state representative Chente Quintanilla. Uh, interesting development. And then the, the probably the biggest one that we have not talked about yet too was the U.S. congressional race. And uh, you know, Beto O'Rourke unseating, you know, a a longtime congressman from our area long-time incumbent. Let's kind of go over some of these in, in, in terms of these races that a lot of people are talking about, which are the ones that stand out in your, in your mind and, and why? Well, naturally, the, uh, the congressional race stands out. Um, and I think, again, I mean, but after so many months of working together where you do all these community events, every race is stuck together. These are all Democrats working together. You know, I mean, like in the end, you, you could not really separate everything because you started to see the factionalism where a certain candidate was tied to another candidate or the group that's supporting them are all working together and what have you. Uh, we watched a congressional race that, that was pretty epic, and we did have a pretty decent voter turnout in this year. It wasn't as high as it was in 2008, but we saw some new energy come out. We mm -hmm. saw some people mobilize in, in a different way. We saw some conventional strategies work with certain populations, and then another group that I feel like in the end, it's the, you know, you look at that race. The reason why it draws attention is that why would such a, a community like El Paso, which does tend to stay off the radar for the most part in terms of national news coverage and, and larger, you know, the political constellation that's, that's always being fought for, to have such a large infusion of super PAC money. You know, that's what really galvanized the situation that I think we have in El Paso, but that we have this, this kind of meta level happening in politics. El Paso is no longer you know, a handful of people in back rooms having meetings. It is a much more multidimensional process of, of how this uh, political engagement is beginning and how this process leads to a new candidate or the viability of even uh, an incumbent. Jaime Abetia, a prominent political blogger in El Paso, mentioned that the Democratic Party is now castrated in our community. Political consultants, Joseph, you having mentioned that you know, it's kind of all Democrats working together. Is there division, and is, for all intents and purposes, the Democratic Party really castrated at the moment I, in our community? I, I think uh, there is a certain amount of division, and uh, I think that the first thing that needs to be done here 
is, uh, uh, I guess you can say, Congressman-elect Beto O'Rourke should come out in full support of Joe Moody. And uh, I think that that would go a long way towards showing that uh, he does want a unified party and, uh, and uh, just to bring us together. Interesting. So Joe Moody wins. He ran unopposed in the primaries. Uh, this is another Texas state uh, representative seat. He was unseated by current state representative Dee Margo. Does, you, you're, you're coming out and saying maybe Beto should get on board with Joe. Why do you say that? Do you think Joe does have a chance of winning uh, this particular race? And, and is his race, because he's going up against such a prominent Republican, that important to unify the party? Absolutely. I, I, I think that uh, I think that Beto should uh, automatically just, he should have already said it. Um, I, if you look at the numbers, uh, Margot uh, won with 3,423. He was unopposed. Uh, Moody had uh, 6,526 votes in the Democratic primary. Um, big, difference. It, big difference. And uh, uh, with, uh, go ahead. Uh, I mean, I don't, I don't disagree with your assessment, but there's the party, which is what you're talking about. And then there's party affiliation. And you know, what is the litmus test for anybody who's running as a Democrat to be affiliated with this party? And to what degree do they advance the interests of that larger party? If you critically review the races, including the congressional one, mm -hmm. there are indicators that we weren't dealing with traditional Democrats, to say the least, in terms of the new candidates. So you're saying the Republicans have crossed over? I feel like if you have a strategy that lures independents and Republicans, and you have a Republican platform with Republican speaking points, and you run as a Democrat, you're still fundamentally a Republican. And if you're expecting that person to lead together some type of unity within this, that's not going to happen. There is uh, power within the Democratic Party in all of its factions, just like El Paso is a group of tribes. In the end, our power is if we can have a united, some type of cohesion, some type of of uh, a vision that brings people together. What we see are, uh, at least at this moment, is a fracture. It is, is, is definitely there are fissures in El Paso's political landscape at this point. But I don't think the current uh, spectrum of candidates are going to lead to unity within the next year or two. I think the presidential race will bring the party together and will bring a new uh, voice to the Democrats in El Paso. It won't, it won't be on a congressional level. I have, so I have a, an interesting analysis based off of what you just said, Joseph. Um, it is true that, that um, a lot of Republicans crossed over to vote for Beto, and that's, that's causing a lot of um, instability within the current party. They don't know whether, you know, to, there's just a lot of, of people didn't expect that win. However, Beto also brought out people who had not voted before, new players in the political party. How do you deal with that? I think capturing those people and, and getting them to stay involved is going to be very crucial for his, for his, uh, for Beto's success going forward and the, the party, the, the county party going forward. I think we need to, to, to make sure we involve all the young people who came out to vote for the first time and also build bridges with the people who are really upset at this victory. You know, it's kind of interesting that you guys bring it up <clears throat> to this point. We're down to just the last few minutes when you're having good conversations, kind of happens. But I see a lot of similarities with what is happening here locally, with also like a reflection of what may happen at a national level. Uh, Obama brought up a lot of new fresh faces to vote. There's now a lot of people that are a little disappointed with Obama because he hasn't delivered. Others are still on board, but he is suffering a little bit on that end. Um, seems like that same kind of energy exists with Beto right mm -hmm. now, and it, it, the question is, how can he deliver uh, in, in, in the next couple of years? That's one question. And the other question is, um, in terms of this being a sign for the president, you know, the president endorsed Congressman Reyes, and so did President Bill Clinton, and so did Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi. Is this a shot across the bow to the president in terms of watch out, Mr. President, look at what happened in El Paso, Mitt Romney could have a shot? Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. uh, not in this community, at least. And the reason for that is, again, we have to go back at uh, the 3,000 plus Republicans that came out uh, to vote in the Democratic primary. Joseph uh, said it well, Diana as well. and. Uh, uh, I just uh, believe that there is an institutional knowledge that has to, uh, uh, that has a huge factor uh, as far as playing uh, in Congress. You mentioned the two years. Mm -hmm. um, what will a freshman congressman do in the next two years? Uh, probably nothing in Congress, but uh, you can you can actually 
uh, have them work on some type of uh, on getting people elected locally. And again, if if that's what he does, if he comes out and supports Joe Moody, uh, those independents, those a couple of those Republicans in a district as close as uh, DeMargo Joe Moody will actually come out, and Joe Moody, a Democrat, will be elected. It, it's earning the trust of this sector, including the party and its fragments, as well as evolving and growing new elements of the Democratic Party. More organized sectors participating in politics in this manner with the currently elected officials and a whole population of new candidates is what what's needs to happen here. There's an opportunity for our new elected representative to bring this sector together. It's kind of interesting that we kind of come full circle. We began talking about the new voice and the role of the new voice in politics, whether it was a new voice or not. And it seems that what's emerging, at least from this political roundtable, and we'll have many more with, with you, hopefully, is the fact that maybe the new voice's role is to be a little bit of a, of a uniter with the community, bring the community back together uh, around certain basic tenets. How and when or if that will happen, it remains to be seen. Um, you guys are obviously already talking about future races. I would like to bring you guys back for that. In the future, the biggest races coming up, either runoff or the biggest races to, to look out for. Just We have one minute. Oh, I know. Uh, the congressional race of 2014. Congressional race of 2014, already yes. throwing it out there, okay? I think the, the um, Representative Quintanilla and Vince Perez runoff will be big um, because it, it overlaps with House District 75 and seeing w the type of people who came out to vote for Mary will be interesting to see how it plays out. That's it. I have to agree. Um, the uh, Chente-Vince race is going to be big. All right, folks, and I'll throw my two cents in. We'll see what starts coming out now for mayor. Uh, keep an eye out for that because there's a lot of people that are going to begin to be talking about that race as soon as we get across this little hump. Folks, it's been an interesting political season. It's not over yet. It's only primaries. Next time, we'll look to have another political roundtable with maybe a few other people to see what they think about the changes in our community. For all of us here at Fronteras, have a good evening. Thank you for watching. I'm Hector H. Lopez.